everyone. Welcome to our live webinar today. Thank you for joining us. Once again, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to meet me yet, I am Natalie Gill, the LLM Programs Assistant here at Coastal Law. Joining me on screen is Dean Ioannidis, Associate Dean of Strategy and Innovation, and Professor Natasha Hines, our guest speaker for the month of January. Before we begin today's presentation, I want to remind everyone that we are recording today's webinar, which will be in listen-only mode. The webinar is meant to be interactive, so please send us your questions using the chat feature on the left-hand side of the screen. If you select private to presenters, your question or comment will only be viewed by the presenters. We will email everyone who registered for today's event a copy of the slides from today's presentation, as well as a link of the recording. And with that, I will turn it over to Dean Margaret Ioannidis. Thank you very much, Natalie, and thank you everyone for joining us from around the world. We are so happy that you've taken the time to join us live. We're looking forward to a wonderful webinar today. We have an outstanding guest speaker, Natasha Hines. Many of you may already know her because she is currently teaching the Employment and Labor Law course in our logistics and transportation program. Before I make the formal introduction to Professor Hines, we wanted to um, take a little poll of the audience and get a little bit more information about those of you who are here and what your specific interests might be. So if you just give me a moment, we'll go ahead and run the poll. The first question we'd like to know is what is your legal background? Are you a foreign educated attorney, a U.S. educated attorney, or a non-attorney? All right, so it looks like we had 83% of the participants are foreign educated attorneys and 8% are non-attorneys um, and we have 8% who are JDs, uh, U.S. educated, so that's great. Um, the next question we had is what you are interested in learning more about, resume drafting, cover letters, job search resources, or all of the above? All right, so that gives us a really, really good idea. We've got about 76% who are interested in all of the above, 15% interested in the job search, and 7% on resume drafting. Uh, so with that said, Professor Hines, it looks like you've got your work cut out for you for the next 55 <laughs> minutes. Um, yes. The nice thing is that Professor Hines is going to be covering all of those concepts during her presentation. I think now we have a better idea on what areas to highlight. Um, in terms of a little bit of background about Professor Hines, she is an adjunct professor and course developer in the Logistics and Transportation Program here at Florida Coastal School of Law in Jacksonville, Florida. She is currently teaching the three-credit course in Employment and Labor Law for Logistics and Transportation. For, so for some of you, this is, uh, this is your professor this semester. She also regularly lectures on topics regarding professionalism and networking. She has practiced in the areas of labor and employment law and personal injury law, including at a private law firm in Sarasota, Florida. She is a member in good standing of the Florida Bar. She's also admitted to practice law in the U.S. District Court, Middle District of Florida. She received her undergraduate degree from Amherst College in Religion and Law, Jurisprudence and Social Thought, and her law degree from Stetson University College of Law. While in law school, Ms. Hines was a teaching fellow in Stetson's nationally recognized research and writing department and served as an editor for the Journal of International Aging, Law, and Policy. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Professor Hines. Thank you very much, Dean Iamides, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, everyone uh, who's joining us near and far. I'm so happy to um, uh, be giving this presentation today. 
and um, I am glad to see that everyone wants to know about everything. <laughs> so um, I have a, a presentation prepared for you, leveraging your LLM degree in the U.S. legal market. And so we are going to cover um, the job search process and uh, a section on the professional view. And we'll start with um, online job search resources, uh, creating job alerts, thinking uh, outside the box, um, so some hot areas of law. Um, in that, we'll talk about some alternative legal careers, and that may be um, uh, very important for those of you who in the poll said you are not attorneys, um, and also for those of you who are attorneys uh, who, or who have a JD but may not want to uh, practice law in the traditional sense of packing up your briefcase and going to a courtroom every day. And then in the section of uh, the professional you, we will talk more about the um, materials that go uh, along with um, the job search. So what do your application materials look like? Um, your resume, your cover letter, and then uh, briefly touch on some other application materials that you may um, be likely to come across um, in the U.S. legal market. So things like a writing sample, um, you may run across employers who want your um, who want copies of your transcripts, um, who may want a, a statement of professionalism or a statement of interest, things like that. So um, just want to prepare you for um, your job search in the U.S. legal market and then leveraging that LLM and all of your wonderful international experience and how you can utilize that. So let's talk first about online job searches. Um, online job searches are a, a great way to get started uh, with your job search in general, but they are not the end all be all. And I'll talk more about that later because networking is also extremely important. Most people, um, whether they're uh, coming to the US with an international background or not, will get their first job um, and then will get many other jobs by networking um, or, or will get leads uh, for jobs by networking. But your online job search is a great place to start where um, you are coming into a new city or a new area in totally unfamiliar territory and you just don't really know the lay of the land. So mainstream job sites like Indeed.com, Monster.com, and Glassdoor.com are great places to start if you've just got to find that needle in the haystack, so to speak. Um, state bar websites um, are also excellent places to start. And I have here a, a bullet on affinity bar associations. Those are... Um, may be somewhat unique to the U.S., but affinity bar associations are, um, are bar associations like um, the Asian American Bar Association, the Latino American Bar Association. Here in Jacksonville, we have the Perkins Bar Association, which um, is named after a prominent uh, African American attorney um, who uh, did a lot of um, prolific things in the community. So typically that's a, a, a an association for the black attorneys in town. It doesn't exclude other attorneys and certainly affinity bar associations do not exclude uh, attorneys who are not of that affinity group, but it's sort of a, a meeting ground for um, attorneys of certain backgrounds. And so those affinity bar associations are one, great places to network, um, great places to make connections um, if you are coming from an international background. So there are international bar associations um, in the US, for example. And so a great way to network and find a, a job uh, job search options as well. Federal government jobs um, can be found uh, on a usajobs.gov um, and various federal agency sites. Um, so, for example, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, posts their jobs on their own website um, for federal agents. Uh, OSCAR is the uh, website 
for judicial clerkships, uh, both federal and state. Um, but to add a little confusion to the mix, you will sometimes see certain states and certain circuits post jobs to their own uh, websites. So it can be a little bit uh, of a daunting task when you're searching. And later on in a slide, you'll see where I have shown you an example of a job search spreadsheet um, that will help you keep track. So another way to help you keep track of your online job search is creating job alerts. Because um, if you get on some a mainstream site like Glassdoor.com and you just start and you just enter um, you know, I think, uh, let's see, I've got someone from Fremont, California here, and you just get on Glassdoor and type in Fremont, California. You're going to get thousands and thousands of jobs. Um, jobs for a server, jobs for a bartender, jobs to do security, um, jobs to do Uber. Um, that is likely not what you're looking for. Um, so you're going to need to have a way to narrow what postings come up. So one of the ways you do that is by creating job alerts and keywords. And that also helps you keep track of new postings, particularly if you're looking and searching on various websites. Um, looking for a job is itself a full-time job. And you're not going to have time um, to go every day to 10, 12, or more different job sites and look at the new postings of the day. You kind of need them to come to you. So what you can do on these various sites is, number one, narrow your job search with key terms. So, for example, um, Fremont, California, but then narrow it to associate attorney bankruptcy, for example, or associate attorney logistics transportation, or associate attorney Spanish speaking, right? And then you set up the job alert that will send you those particular jobs um, for, uh, for those postings, and you can set them to send you new postings once a day, once every three days, once every other week, so on and so forth. So, Moving on to thinking outside the box. This is what I was referencing um, in talking about um, non what we call non-traditional or alternative legal careers. And these are growing steadily in popularity um, for uh, individuals who um, perhaps have their JD but do not want to practice law in a traditional sense um, and for non-attorneys who have, for example, a certificate, um, for example, our certificate in logistics and transportation, or another certificate um, in, in one of the other programs. So um, industries such as human resources, project management, government relations, public relations, academia, so being a, a professor um, at an undergrad or community college, legal support services, so paralegals, legal assistance, compliance, this is a huge, uh, huge area of growth. Um, and compliance comes in many forms, banking, healthcare, um, inform information technology, which you'll hear abbreviated as IT, uh, governmental affairs and governmental compliance. Immigration compliance is huge, uh, particularly in public companies because, uh, I'm sorry, private companies in the private sector. Um, there are a lot of um, laws, rules, and regulations with immigration compliance, and private companies desperately need um, people with international skills and international backgrounds to handle um, all of the uh, uh, laws, rules, and regulations and their interpretations with regards to um, compliance with immigration, also in the healthcare industry as well. Um, so you'll see those jobs listed as um, uh, uh, compliance personnel or human resources generalist or human resource specialist. Um, very important to look at those. You can set up your keywords to search for those. Um, you can set up keywords to search for the level of job you want. For example, manager or foreman, 
director, coordinator, specialist, generalist, things like that. Okay, or you can set them for um, keywords like with the substantive or subject matter that you're looking for, like logistics, transportation, human resources, longshoremen, um, uh, things like that. So you can look for the substance as well. Um, labor or negotiator, mediator, all good ideas. But when we say thinking outside the box or we, or we say non-traditional or alternative legal careers, that's what we mean. Now, keep in mind that it may be necessary uh, to explain to an employer what your JD, what value your JD or your LLM or your um, logistics and transportation certificate brings. It may not always be very apparent to them. So you may have to explain what a particular course means or how that course is going to be valuable to them. Now, let's move on to networking because I touched on this earlier, but networking is a very, very powerful tool in your job search. And really, once you land that job and continuing to move you forward in your career, um, in your company, in your law firm, in your organization, wherever you land, it's key to you getting that promotion and continuing to advance yourself. So you have to use every opportunity. Um, that means not just the um, sort of stereotypical sense that we may think of networking, like you go to a cocktail party after work and shake a bunch of hands and pass out business cards and collect business cards and then go home and that's it. Um, that is uh, making sure that you talk to people about what you do and what your background is when you are picking up your kids from school, when you are waiting for your flight at the airport, when you are picking up your dry cleaning, when you are getting your nails done at the salon, um, really any anywhere that you happen to be. Use every opportunity. Um, I tell um, students this all the time. Um, we tend to, when we're out in public, have our nose noses stuck in our phones. Um, be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of where you are and what opportunities you can use. Alumni networks are great at every stage of life. I personally continue to be active with my Amherst alumni network um, for my undergraduate institution. I'm active with the Stetson alumni group. In fact, I'm going to a, an alumni network event tonight. Um, so I continue to do that um, networking for myself as well. Informational interviews. Um, in, informational interviews are a little bit different than a traditional interview where you're uh, invited by a potential employer to uh, interview for a particular position. Informational interviews are something that you would set up after maybe initially meeting someone uh, during a networking opportunity, and you uh, would go and seek out more information about what they this individual does in their profession, in their job, in their office. So you're not necessarily asking for a job, you're gathering information. But informational interviews are powerful because you never know what that individual may remember about you. And if an opportunity becomes available, they may remember, oh, wow, I met um, Karen and she was a wonderful person. And I know that she speaks three languages and we have a human resources director position coming up and she has the skill set and the background we need to be able to do that. Oh, we have a director of governmental affairs position coming up and we have someone who's worked at um, the UN and has embassy experience and we need that person to come aboard. Um, so again, these connections matter. Community groups and doing community um, service, very important, a very great way to meet people and also to feel enriched. Um, so again, many graduates um, and students obtain their jobs through networking. Um, and in fact, I obtained my first job um, through networking. So it's very important to do that. Um, its importance cannot be underestimated. Um, those who know me and who've been in my live classes um, know that I sound like a broken record about that. 
So this was the job, the chart that I was uh, explaining earlier, tracking your progress with your job search. Um, this is extremely important um, because when you are searching for a job, it can be very daunting to keep up with where you applied, where the employer is located, particularly if you have an expanded search, if you're searching all over the U.S., or even if you're searching all over a particular state. You want to make sure you're keeping track of, oh, okay, I applied for this job in Orlando and another one in Tampa and another one in Miami. Um, you want to keep track of a certain benefit. So here you'll see um, this person kept track of whether um, relocation for the position was paid or unpaid because that was an intangible that was very, very important to them. So perhaps that's something that's very important or if, if maybe health insurance was something that you wanted to keep track of, you may place that here. Um, if there's an application deadline, um, state or federal or public or private, you may want to put that here. Um, where you apply, did you apply online? Was it a direct email to um, an HR manager? Did you apply through a network? And then the requirements, meaning what did you send? Did the job posting or the lead call for just a cover letter or a resume? Um, was it an online application that didn't require either one? Uh, because a lot of times the online applications just require you to literally retype your resume into the online application. Um, and who, if, if any, is an email contact? Another good uh, calling to keep is keeping track of whether or not you followed up, and if so, when, and what was the result. So this sheet, this tracking sheet, is very, very important to help you keep your sanity, help you keep track of what you're doing. Um, also, when you get called up for an interview, you know what you've sent to that employer so that you make sure you can take extra copies with you. Um, you make sure you um, can uh, readily and quickly re-research uh, re where you've applied, look up the potential employer, and be ready for um, that interview. So let's move on to um, the professional you, uh, our written materials and um, and uh, our uh, resume and cover letter. And one thing that I, I do want to emphasize again is remember that your LLM and your, your LMT certificate, whatever you're working on, right, these are special uh, classes, special courses, special accomplishments that really set you apart. Um, your international background and training are, are very unique particularly if you speak another language, um, a, a language other than English. Um, I can't tell you how many postings, particularly in certain cities and in certain communities. Um, when I look at job postings, I'll use Miami as an example. When I look at job postings um, in Miami and I talk to um, uh, em employment professionals and labor professionals, um, whether they're attorneys or working in, in the HR industry in Miami, um, in uh, coastal cities in California, um, in border cities in Texas, it is almost mandatory that uh, their candidates speak Spanish. Um, and in fact, it will without fail be in a job posting. And that's really at any level. They're going to usually want their attorneys to speak Spanish. They're going to want the support staff to speak Spanish. Um, I'm seeing that more and more in postings in DC, in New York, that they want you to speak another language or that if you do speak another language, it's really going to put you, um, at an advantage. Um, Another thing that um, it tends to be uh, viewed very favorably is um, any sort of uh, military service, whether that's um, uh, here in the U.S. or abroad. Um, 
we call it here in the U.S., we call it Veterans Preference, um, and that's a whole set of forms and, and different acronyms that you get to use when applying for certain federal jobs. Um, but that's something that's very valuable. So international experience, if you've had certain internships, if you've gotten certain fellowships that enabled you to do work abroad, if you've been in study abroad programs, exchange programs, please highlight that on your resume, in your cover letter, and talk about that because it is something that really sets you apart and, and makes you very valuable to employers, particularly employers who uh, are global who have offices outside the U.S. Um, or service clients or um, uh, customers outside the U.S. So I just want to underscore the importance of that, um, particularly as we move into talking about um, the professional um, materials. So some of these slides I may move through pretty quickly because they're going to be sent to you and posted. Um, and I don't, I don't want to get into reading them to you because some of them are, are examples of the text that should be in a cover letter or resume. So what makes a strong resume? Um, Tips on that. We want to emphasize transferable skills. And this is very important for some of you who may not have actual legal experience yet, or who may have legal experience in a certain practice area or field, but you're trying to break into another field. So let's say um, in um, the country where you earned your uh, law degree, you did um, a, a certain type of law. You did uh, maybe um, some sort of governmental affairs. But now that you are moving to or looking to work in the U.S., you may be interested in doing um, uh, maybe employment law, or you may be interested in doing personal injury or bankruptcy. So you have legal experience. You just don't have legal experience um, in the type of law that you want to practice. You're going to have to emphasize transferable skills. No, I don't know the substantive area of family law, but I have trial experience. Oh, I have experience meeting with clients and dealing with clients and running a law office, okay? Um, I don't have U.S. legal experience, but I started and successfully ran my own law firm in Brazil. Um, I ran my own law firm in Korea, for example, okay? So um, that, that is what I mean by transferable skills. You need to make sure that your resume is targeted to an audience. So that may mean that you have a few different versions of your resume. For example, if you are applying for some non-traditional legal careers and then some law firm jobs, um, you may uh, have a couple of different versions of your resume and your cover letter, but we'll get to that later. It goes without saying that your resume needs to be neat, concise, and error-free. Uh, please, 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 if you have to have 10, 20, 1,000 people read it, no typos. Um, make sure that it's all in the same font. You don't have anything um, in different colors, um, no pictures on it, um, nothing that is, uh, is memorable in a bad way. Um, make sure that it's continuously updated. Your resume is a living document. So one thing that I would see a lot is, um, especially with experienced professionals who were deciding to change careers, they'd have a resume already, but it hadn't been updated in five, six, seven, ten years. And it became a very daunting task to do that because it was very difficult for them to articulate what they had done over those years. If you continuously keep your resume updated, even if you just look at it once a year and just keep it updated, that will help you so much. When describing your duties and tasks and accomplishments, use specific examples. No, you don't want your resume to be 30 or 40 pages long, but saying something in your resume like hard worker or determined or perseverant advocate uh, is sort of a misnomer. I hope that you're hardworking and I hope that you're perseverant because no professional is going to put on their resume that I want to work hard and or I want to 
not work that hard and get paid a lot of money. Um, no one's going to put that on their resume. So use specific examples. Um, I, uh, you know, successfully uh, managed a team of 20, uh, 20 uh, managers, right, or um, brought in $250,000 in revenue in first quarter. Okay, so that's what I mean by specific examples. And then overall, you want it to have a professional appearance. Remember, your resume is your personal marketing piece. And this touches on what I already said, but I already have a resume. Yes, but is it a legal resume, right? If you're looking at law firms, if you're looking in the legal field, is it in legal format? Um, a, a CV um, or curriculum vitae is a little bit different than a legal resume. A legal resume tends to be um, much more concise. Um, so we'll see some examples of that. <clears throat> Does it accurately highlight your international background and experience? Right? We talked about that. We really want to showcase that and leverage it in the, in the U.S. job market. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes it's easiest to start with a blank sheet of paper. Um, yes, you can cut and paste some from what you already have, but <clears throat> if you have a resume, for example, I see this a lot um, with those who have served in the, in the military. Um, a military resume or a federal resume looks very, very different. They tend to be extremely long, and they tend to be full of acronyms that are completely unrecognizable to civilians. Um, in that sense, sometimes it's easiest to start with a blank sheet of paper because a, a civilian is not going to be able to decipher um, a lot of military lingo. Um, and then in some instances, yes, you can transfer the information from your old resume to your new legal resume. Now let's go step by step. Step one, you need to establish your professional identity. Decide what your name is. Well, that sounds like a no-brainer, but sometimes it isn't. Um, specific, uh, some, especially if um, you have um, a hyphen in your name. Um, I have a very uh, close friend of mine who's also an attorney. Her name is hyphenated. And it drives her crazy when people forget to add both of her names and just assume that she picks one over the other. So she's very adamant that both of her names are used, and she uses it on everything, on her business cards, her resumes, her emails, all of that. She doesn't pick one or the other and then get upset when people use the wrong one, okay? So if you are, for example, Lorena um, Isabel Ortiz, you need to decide and pick one. Are you going to be Lorena I. Ortiz? Are you going to be Lorena Isabel Ortiz? Are you going to be L. Isabel Ortiz? Any three, any of the three are fine, but pick one and stay consistent, okay? So establish your professional identity. And then once you pick which one you're going to be, so I decided I'm Natasha D. Hines, okay? So your name should stand out more than your contact information at the top of your resume. You want it to be bold and bold lettering. Um, some people decide to put theirs in all caps or in italics. That's fine. Again, just make sure it looks uniform between your resume, your cover letter. If you have a list of references, that sort of thing, it makes it, it looks all uniform on all of your application materials, kind of like it would if you're a brand. Step two, your contact information. It has to be current, 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 current. Nothing is worse than you send out your resume, your cover letter, any other application material. An employer says, oh, my goodness, Natasha's great. I'm going to contact her for an interview. And they send an email, and it bounces back as undeliverable because it's an old email address or it's out of service. Um, they make a phone call to you and it's out of service. Or um, this, I, most employers don't send an, a, a letter via U.S. mail for an interview anymore, but they send a letter and it gets returned, right? Um, make sure that all contact information you include is current. Also, very important, make sure it's professional. 
don't use an email address that is something silly like cutiefunpie at yahoo.com, right? It needs to be some variation of your name, L Ortiz at, FS, uh, at fcsl.edu or L Ortiz at aol.com. It needs to be something polished and professional. Your uh, uh, telephone number as well. Please beware of what your voicemail says. Potential employers should not call and get a, a joke, a, a joke voicemail or hear an inappropriate song with profanities. I have definitely had that occur. Um, it's not professional. Remember, you are presenting yourself as a professional um, and make sure that, that that does not occur. Step three, your education and bar admission um, if applicable. And uh, just to pause here, I do see that some of you have questions. I will answer all those questions at the end. I just want to make sure that I get through uh, the, the whole presentation. So I'm not ignoring you, uh, just to, to make that clear. Um, step three, your education and bar admission if applicable. So you want to list, uh, start by listing uh, if you have your LLM. Uh, or your certificate, you want to list that from Florida Coastal School of Law. Uh, you list it in ascending order, so the degree you have or you will have uh, uh, most recently, and then go from there. Um, any other graduate program, then your undergraduate degree. Um, it's customary in the U.S. that we do not list anything from high school. Um, that, that ship has sailed. Uh, we're done. <laughs> so if you've done amazing and awesome things in high school or you went to a very famous um, or world-renowned high school, um, that is awesome and it's great, but it's just not customary in, in the U.S. At, at this level, once you've gotten to this level, to list your high school. And you generally won't see that on applications because the assumption is that if you've gotten, if you've earned a bachelor's degree, master's degree, JD, LLM, uh, certificate, so on and so forth, you've obviously finished high school. So there's, there's no question about that. Um, listed under um, your um, schools, any relevant extracurriculars um, underneath the school. So let's say, for example, while you were an undergrad, you did a study abroad program. Uh, you want to list that. If you were in the um, International Film Society Club, right? Anything related to um, international programs. Um, you were in um, or did active in uh, any extracurricular activities, the International Business Law Society. You want to list that underneath um, whichever school it corresponds with. And here I just... Uh, I'm posting an example. So you see that um, in this example, the name is featured prominently. We assume that this person has um, their current contact information, um, their bar admission um, to um, uh, for India is listed here and the date. And then um, they start here with their LLM program, their law degree that they earned at a government law college in Bombay, India. Um, this person had an excellent class rank, so they chose to put that there. Um, and then um, their bachelor's degree, which they also earned in India at St. Xavier's College. And then again, you'll see where um, this person was in um, moot court, so they put uh, their um, extracurriculars and honors underneath the corresponding school. So this is an example of what we've discussed so far. Step four, let's talk about experience because that's the next thing that would come on your resume. So you'll see different types of experience, your legal experience, your international or cross-cultural experience, professional or related experience, in talking about your experience on your resume, you want to use action verbs. It's very important. Um, and you want to stress tasks and responsibilities. You want to be descriptive while focusing on what transferable skills. How do the skills that you've acquired, your experiences, 
transfer to the job that you want. Um, and again, that may be something that you have to explain along with what your LLM or what your certificate is. So here's an example from the same resume. All I did was, was chop it up for you so that we could piece this out. So here you'll see in Jonathan's resume, here's his, he's chosen to break his, his experience up. So first he has legal experience. He worked in the chambers um, of advocate Shyam Divan in Bombay, India as an attorney. So this would have been a, a U.S. version of a law firm. And so he lists there, developed, conducted. See the strong verbs that he uses? He, so that if I'm an HR person or I'm a busy partner at a law firm and I have 30 seconds to read his resume, all I see is developed, conducted, counseled, assisted, drafted, researched. Boom, boom, boom. I see all of these um, great verbs. He's developed an independent practice. He's briefed. He's conducted arbitration hearings. He's counseled environmental groups. I haven't even read the whole resume and I'm impressed, right? Step five, an interest section. Why is this important? This is important because it shows a different part of you um, that is not necessarily the um, this candidate is good on paper part. This is a great conversation starter. It shows who you are outside of law school, outside of your profession. It helps personalize your resume and employers find it interesting. It's also yet another way to showcase any sort of special international background or training um, or interest that you may have. Just make sure that it is appropriate and relevant. So let's say that you are a ballet dancer, you're an avid golfer. Um, for personally, I have played the violin for 20 years. I don't know how, I can't tell you how many times that I've spent half the interview answering questions about that versus where I went to school or what briefs I've written or motions I've, I've argued. Step six, what else? What else is on a resume? You may want to consider adding skills. Um, if you have a specific skill set, uh, for example, you, you have um, special training writing appellate briefs. Um, that may be something you want to mention. If you're very skilled in a specific computer program, um, that would be something um, that would be worth mentioning in your resume. Community involvement and pro bono work. That is recent or um, recent and uh and active. If you did a river cleanup 15 years ago, um, that's something you want to leave off. Licenses, very interesting. Um, we'll come across lots of um, students who have active nursing licenses, active pilot licenses, people who are certified public accountants. Definitely include that on your resume. And you see here in bold red, languages. If you are proficient in writing, speaking, understanding languages, please put that on there. Um, if you are a certified courtroom interpreter, definitely, definitely include that. Things not to include on a U.S. resume, um, uh, personal inappropriate information, um, marital status. We uh, generally do not include that in U.S. resumes um, and uh, interviews. Um, it's uh, inappropriate for an employer to ask about family status, whether you're married or have children. Um, it may come up in casual conversation, but um, generally that's something that is off limits. Um, we also do not put photos, selfies, portraits, any sort of photographs of the applicant on a, a U.S. resume. Now, I want to quickly get through cover letters. And again, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them um, at the end. Uh, I want to make sure that I get through all of the um, content here. So um, will the cover letter be read? Nine times out of 10, yes. I've only heard of a few employers saying that they really don't pay much attention to cover letters, but by and large in the legal field, yes, cover letters are read um, because uh, if for no other reason than 
employers want to know that you're a good writer, that you're a strong writer. So even if they breeze through the content or the substantive part of the cover letter because they think, ah, oh, everyone puffs and embellishes, they want to know that you can string together sentences and be a good advocate. So that is one of the many reasons why the cover letter is important. The other reason the cover letter is important and is very likely to be read is because it gives you a chance to elaborate further on the very short kind of bullet points that you're only able to put in your resume. And you can further elaborate on your international background, gives you space to explain more about your LLM degree or your logistics and transportation certificate, about your coursework, and about your transferable skills and how they make you the best candidate for the position you're seeking. So how are cover letters used? They're used in a few ways. Um, one, they're used to weed out applicants. Um, firms will generally be able to, firms and organizations will generally be able to tell whether or not you're interested in that job or just a job in general. Um, you know, if you've got the firm or organization name incorrect, um, if spelled wrong, or you don't even mention the firm name or organization name at all, that's a huge red flag that you really don't care about that particular job. You always want to, to the, the extent humanly possible, find the name of the contact person or the committee or whom, whomever you know may touch that uh, application or be making the hiring decision. That's so much better than addressing the cover letter to whom it may concern, um, if you can address it to an actual person. You want, um, they also are used to eliminate applicants whose letters show a lack of research, knowledge about, or interest in the employer's work. Um, you know, if you are interested in immigration law and um, you just, and, and the firm does bankruptcy and you mention nothing about how your work with, um, you know, family law is transferable. It, it, it just, it's going to fall flat. Um, and they also look to see if there are geographic ties or other information explain why you're interested in that city or employer. So again, if you are coming um, from out of state, from out of the country, and you want to emphasize to the employer, look, I'm interested in coming to this new place. I, I have no plans to leave. I have ties here. You want to emphasize those geographic ties. I have a cousin here. I visit, visited multiple times. Or if you don't have family there, you don't have any ties. Emphasize why you want to put down roots there, why you're interested there um, in that particular area to, to further bolster for that employer um, why you would be loyal. Crucial points to remember. Who are you sending the letter to? So who's your audience? Why are you sending the letter? Why do you want that job, not just a job? What are you hoping this person can do for you? What connection can you make with your reader? So again, that requires some research. Cover letters are time consuming. What makes you unique? Hint, hint, your international training background, that great LLM, that great logistics and transportation certificate. Okay, why should the reader hire you? And biggest hint, because I need a job is not a good answer. <laughs> Now, let's talk briefly about cover letter format. Generally, you want to stick to a four-paragraph approach. A cover letter that spills over to two um, pages or longer, um, it, it, usually the whole thing is not going to get read. So we want to be um, concise. Um, so you want to look at samples but not rely solely on the samples. Um, personalized is best. You'll likely have several versions of your cover letter. Yes, it is time consuming. Again, applying for jobs is a full-time job. But once you get a few versions of your cover letter down, um, you'll have it pretty much down to a science and you'll be able to kind of tweak them um, and go on from there. Just be careful that if you're doing a lot of cutting and pasting, that you're also doing some close reading so that you're not um, unwittingly sending the wrong cover letters to the wrong firms and mixing up names and mixing up organization and company names and whatnot. 
Again, use your cover letter to shine and showcase your international background and experience. So in your first paragraph, you want to establish a connection if you have one to the potential employer. For example, George Clooney, my law professor at Florida Coastal School of Law, recommended I contact you to discuss employment opportunities with your firm. Or I learned of this wonderful position through X, Y, and Z, through Professor So-and-so, or through Dean So-and-so. Next, explain why you are writing with honest enthusiasm. My strong interest in immigration law prompts this correspondence, or I am writing to express my interest in this position because my strong, uh, because of my, you know, strong background in immigration law, because of such and such firms to commitment uh, to immigration law and business practice, whatever. So you want to kind of open with why you're writing and with honest enthusiasm. In your second paragraph, explain why you want to work for this particular employer. For example, I'm seeking a position with, insert employer, beginning in June 2017. Now, you, you, may, you, you can leave out the date. The date is there um, for those who may be seeking in the future, like you haven't relocated yet. And so you're letting them know that you're not there, you're not in your particular location yet, but you're looking in the future. I will graduate, or because you're you're not, you haven't yet graduated, I will graduate from Florida Coastal School of Law in May 2017. Um, or for those of you who will be taking a bar exam, um, again, U.S. employers know that the bar exam is administered twice a year. And so if you're, you know, looking in May, you you're going to usually be taking the July bar, and depending on the state, they kind of know when results will be released. So you tell them why, uh, tell them why, why them, why that employer with specific knowledge about them. I am interested in your firm because of its focus in immigration law, generally and more particularly because of your firm's work in the field of employment-based immigration of, you know, business-based immigration, of family-based whatever, right? You want to show them you've done your research. Then paragraph three highlights um, relevant experiences, your relevant experiences. Highlight particular relevant achievements. Show your demonstrated interest. Again, you've done research. You may tell a narrative or story about a relevant experience. But the point is that you stand out in a positive way and that you emphasize relevant international work experiences, languages spoken, um, touch on that uh, LLM, that uh, logistics and transportation certificate again. And more importantly, explain how your skills are transferable to the particular industry, right? If you're not a, an attorney or looking in a, if you're looking in an alternative legal career or your practice area. So what, basically, why you? What do you offer? Is it experience? Is it a particular educational background? Is it a life path? What makes you different? Make the connection for that employer. Bridge the gap for them. Bridge that gap between their needs and your skills, right? What makes you unique? And what makes you the right candidate for this position? Here's an example for you of that paragraph three. My longstanding interest in immigration law issues prompted me to pursue work as a legal assistant in the field of immigration law. I found my work as a legal assistant so fulfilling that I returned to law school to pursue my LLM degree in U.S. law from Florida Coastal School of Law with the goal of passing the bar exam in the United States and being able to practice as an immigration attorney. As part of my LLM studies, I even took an elective course in immigration law and participated in student organizations and events that pertained to immigration law. In paragraph four, your final paragraph, establish a next step. You say thank you. You thank the potential employer for their consideration. Now I have two options here. Um, option A is putting the ball in their court. I look forward to hearing from you or if I can answer any more questions, please do not hesitate to ask or if I can provide any more uh, materials or information, I'm happy to do so. And then option B is putting the ball um, in your court. I will be in touch in three weeks. 
I presented both options to you. Option B tends to be a bit too aggressive. I don't recommend option B. I just wanted you to know it exists. Option A is the better and more professional option to give. Um, so here's a sample for you. I look forward to the opportunity to speak with you further and thank you for your consideration. Please do not hesitate to contact me uh, to contact me with any questions. I look forward to hearing from you. And then remember, every cover letter is different. Um, a good cover letter takes time and personalization counts. There is no easy way to do a cover letter. Um, if given the opportunity, always include one. So there may be times where the job posting or where the lead, uh, if you hear about a job opportunity through um, a, a colleague or a friend, they may say, hey, pass me your resume. Um, even if there's not a, a cover letter that's specifically asked for, always include one. There's no harm in doing that. It can only help you. So now I will um, take some time for questions. Thank you so much, Natasha. That was a wonderful presentation. I, uh, I've been working this chat feature here on the left side of the screen. Excellent questions have been coming in today. Um, you know, a lot of uh, students have asked questions related to, you know, how to tie their international experience in on the resume and on the cover letter. Can you maybe go a little bit more in depth um, in terms of how to highlight foreign language experience, maybe how to highlight overseas legal experience and tie that into the U.S. legal market? Yes. So I would emphasize um, when when I talk about transferable skills, um, it may require some explaining for U.S. employers. So um, I would talk more about um, things that are familiar in the U.S. legal system, like if you've gone to court, if you've um, argued motions, if you've done hearings, if you have uh, coordinated meetings with clients, um, you have written and researched articles, you've been on law review, moot court, um, any sort of trials you've done, you've been a prosecutor, um, things like that are things that ring as familiar in the U.S. legal market and are transferable. If you are more, so that's more like litigation focused. If you are someone who's looking at more transactional work, then I would emphasize more um, if you, let's say you did commercial development or you worked on, you worked in the banking field. Um, so you did work with uh, government contracts or private contracts. Then in your resume, in your cover letter, explain the type of work you did with those contracts, the type of drafting and writing and research that you did if that, that makes sense or further clarifies. Thank you, Professor Hines. That's excellent. Um, a few more comments that have come in. Um, actually, several of the participants have mentioned that in their countries, um, there are special tests that are required by law firms for individuals seeking opportunities there, um, and that in some cases, those um, help in screening out applicants. Is anything like that used by law firms here in the U.S.? It depends on the law firm. Um, I have heard of some law firms. Um, so, okay, it depends on the law firm. Um, some, many law firms in the initial application process will ask you for a recent writing sample. Um, and so that's not necessarily a proficiency test where you're sitting down and they're, you know, testing you like they did on the LSAT or bar exam, but they do want some sense of your level of proficiency with writing. And, and it doesn't matter whether you're internationally trained or not, they want a writing sample. It's just part of their application process. Some law firms, depending on their practice area or, you know, how the partners run the firm, I have heard of them um, once they narrow down their candidate pool, um, having you come in and, you know, do an exercise where they 
um, have you write a demand letter or have you write, uh, do some sort of writing exercise. Um, there's also a movement um, among certain law firms where there's more of an emphasis on um, personality and character. And so I have heard uh, of law firms doing personality tests. Um, the DISC profile um, is one of them. Um, and uh, online assessments where, again, it's, it has nothing to do with, you know, do you know this particular area of law, but more so with can we work with you day to day in the office? Are you a nice person? Will clients like you? Um, but it, I would say it really depends on the firm, and they'll tell they'll tell you that you know whether they require some sort of test. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I wonder maybe there's time for one last question. If somebody would like to type it in in the chat feature, um, I'm going to go ahead and then turn things back over to Natalie Gill after after any final questions. Thank you, Dean Ionides and Professor Hines. Um, please feel free to use the chat feature um, and type in your questions as we wrap up here. Our contact information is here, so please reach out to us with any of your questions that you may have. Um, and finally, I would like to extend an invitation um, for all of you to join us at next online event. Here is um, some more information on our LLM programs. Um, our next speaker series event is on Tuesday, February the 21st at noon. Uh, Professor Anthony Colink will be our guest speaker presenting on the topic, Current Freedom of Religion, Legal Conflicts in America and Europe. Please remember that even if you can't attend or participate live, you can still get a copy of the slides um, and recording by simply registering for the event. Um, please visit our U.S. Law LLM and LLM in Logistics and Transportation Facebook page. We just posted some pictures of the webinar and give us a like. Also, feel free to post um, a selfie of where you're from if you haven't yet done that. And with that, Again, a huge thank you to everyone who has joined us today and to Professor Hines for taking the time to put together and share this amazing presentation. See you all at next month's Florida Coastal Online LLM Program Speakers event.